This is episode 137 of the Nursing Home Abuse Podcast. What solutions can lawyers provide in nursing home cases? The Nursing Home Abuse Podcast is dedicated to providing news and information for families whose loved ones have been injured in a nursing home. Here are your hosts, Georgia attorneys Rob Schenk and Will Smith. Hey out there, welcome back. Hope you had a pleasant Thanksgiving. My name is Rob Schenk. And I'm Will Smith. And we are your hosts for this episode. Coming at you um, kind of on the fly. We had a we had a guest that we had scheduled in this time to interview, and they were unable to make it. So this is going to be what you would call off the top of the dome type of episode. Um, and we kind of balling. We were spitballing. We kind of brainstormed a little bit, but Will came up with the concept of talking about what um, someone could expect from a nursing home. Uh, trial or arbitration and what it what the civil justice system can't do um so we're gonna kind of unpack that and talk about that so um this is a good topic because people call we and we talk to people on a daily basis that have had a loved one in a nursing home that has uh encountered some sort of adverse situation and they want they want a solution. I mean, that's why they're calling attorneys. And people will often tell us, you know, this isn't about the money. It's really just it. This is not right. And we, we want them um, to not do this anymore. We want them to change the way that they're taking care of of our loved one. Um, And what people have to remember is that we can only get one solution. We can only we can only achieve one thing in a court of law against a nursing home. And that is an award of money of monetary damages. We can't get the nursing home to, we can't have a judge decide that a nursing home has to do a, B and C. So we can never sue a nursing home and then have a judge or a jury say, all right, well, we've decided in the plaintiff's favor. And from now on, you will have to do X, Y, and Z when you have new residents, or you will have to take care of them in this way. It's just not in the court's purview. Right. The only thing they can give is damages. So just let me let let Will and I take you to day three of law school, um, and and this is something that you know you can you can take with you in terms of going forward with how you think the civil justice system works. But um, back in the day, uh, there were two different courts. There was a court of equity and a court of law. And I promise this will make sense. And this is because I know that that Will gets mad at me and, and my wife gets mad at me for going back too far in terms of explaining myself. But a long time ago, and Will's already gone for his phone, there was a court of equity and there was a court of law. Mm-hmm. And you would go to the court of equity to get a judge to make somebody do something or not do something. So back in the day, you might go to the, the court of equity to go judge. My neighbor has erected a fence and it's um, it's encroaching on my property. It's like five feet into my property. So in that instance, the reason why you would go to that judge in the equity court is because money won't do you any good. You want to be able to use your yard. Or perhaps you purchased a -a one-of-a-kind painting, and you paid the money, and the artist has not delivered that painting. And and money is not going to do you any good because you want that painting. There's only one painting in the whole world like it. So you go to the court of equity because that is a court in which the judge has the authority to tell somebody, give over the painting, or to move the fence back five feet. Mm-hmm. Having the court tell somebody to do something or not do something is an equitable remedy. The term of art that we learn in law school is remedy, basically. So you go to the court of equity for a remedy. Or an equitable remedy. An equitable as remedy. As opposed to a legal remedy. Right. So... Um, but then back in the day, you would go to a court of law if the situation that you find yourself in, that you're going against a defendant in which money would make you whole. 
So you would get money damages. We call it damages of the money in a court of law. Um, so that's the overarching difference between those two courts, the old school court of equity and the old school courts of law, is that one, the only way that you can be made whole is if the judge has somebody do something. In the other court, the only way that you're made whole is that that you get compensated with money. Through time, we realized that our civil justice system, that remedies, the equitable remedies, were difficult to enforce, mm-hmm. and um, it, it, it wasn't an efficient process. So eventually, as we all know, some of us know, the courts merged at some point. So all courts basically can provide, most all courts can provide equitable as well as damages um, uh, to the plaintiffs. However, in that process of these courts merging, most courts now disfavor equitable remedies to the point where if there's any way that money damages can make you whole, Right. They're going to award money damages. And through the time, that means that if I rear end somebody um, and I hurt them and I damage their car, 500 years ago, maybe I'd go to the equitable uh, court of equity and the judge would go, okay, now you ram his car and you and you hurt him. Or or you go you go till his field and, and plow his field what, because he's now injured because you guys had an accident. Exactly. And yeah. so now we, have, like I said, we've disfavored that in, in, in the law. And wherever we can, we want to award money damages to the point now where the concept of an equitable remedy is basically nowadays the only time that you're going to get that is in what's called more popularly a temporary restraining order or a permanent restraining order where we tell the, we tell an individual they can't be near somebody. Right. There's going to, there's going to be only a certain amount of times where money doesn't fix the problem. And and um, there's there's going to be no time in which you hire attorneys like us that you're going to get something other than money, right? So and and just to to kind of wrap up the court of equity um, concept, um, the mode of enforcement in a court of equity or an equitable remedy is the the individual that has been decreed that they need to do something or not do something. If it turns out that they haven't done what they were supposed to, the the court has the power to place them in jail. So the power of the court in that instance is to to enforce the the verdict is to put the person in jail if they haven't done it. So in the in the the example of the trespassing of the fence, if you go back to the court a month later and say, Judge, this the, my neighbor hasn't moved the fence, the judge can go, All right, he goes to jail. Right. Um, in the on the other court, on the other court, the court of law, where you get damages, if you get a, a verdict against a nursing home um, for X amount of dollars and they haven't paid, then you get the the mode of enforcement is collection. You can levy on the bank accounts, you can put liens on property, that type of thing. But that's the mode of enforcement in in both of those avenues. But again, the main idea um, that will to to piggyback off of what Will is saying is that sometimes our clients come in. And they want equitable remedies mm-hmm. to their problems. Either equitable remedies or they're looking for criminal charges. Okay, that's right. So, and we can address criminal charges, but people want to, people want things like, I just want this nursing home. I want this verdict. If we get a verdict in the case, I want the nursing home to now have policies and procedures that say they have to, you know, have a better cell phone social media policy. Yeah. Or I want their policies and procedures to be updated every year. I can't or we can't as lawyers get that for you in all. in the in the court. In the court. Um however, um well, let me just finish that concept up. So we can't get that type of thing for you. The only thing that we're going to be able to do for you under the statutes that we file suit under or under the common law for for tort damages or medical malpractice is money damages. Mm-hmm. Now, there are instances and we've we've gone down this road before where in mediation we might bargain for those remedies. So for example, we could we say things along the lines of okay, my client is willing to settle for x amount of dollars, but 
a condition of this settlement is that you rewrite your policies pursuant to X, Y, and Z, and that's and then we do it and we use the court as the enforcement mechanism for that. That would be the only time that you're going to be able to use the civil justice system, or one of the only times you're going to be able to use the civil justice system to get an equitable remedy in that in that capacity, if that makes any sense. And that's very unlikely. Yeah. So, um, but at any rate, that is what we, why we're, we're talking about that because we have clients that come in and they want these things that, that the civil justice system does not allow for. Yeah. The only thing, and, and I understand when people say, you know, this isn't about money. At the end of the day, it is all about money. The only thing that we can get is a verdict that says on a piece of paper, we find uh, in favor of the plaintiff for X amount of, of dollars for pain and suffering, for wrongful death. And what, what your hope is, is that that's painful enough to the nursing home that they change their calculations because they they put this into their calculation. Well, this is what the average jury verdict is for wrongful death, for uh, for pain and suffering. And so it's worth, it's the cost to do in business for us to cut corners and not have enough staff because it's not really significant. Um, So that's why you want to get a higher jury verdict. That's why you want to get more money. That's why we do for the clients, because eventually that goes into policy and decision making for the healthcare industry. And they go, hey, listen, we're getting slammed on negligence cases. Um, Maybe we need to hire more staff. It's not worth it. And in any complaints that you hear about, you know, uh, tort reform or these runaway jury verdicts, ask, ask for more information. Anybody tells you, well, what's wrong is that we have a jury system where there's all these runaway jury verdicts. How many jury verdicts are they talking about? I guarantee you nobody who makes those complaints has any numbers. Um, There are tens of thousands of, of cases filed in, in the nation every year very few jury verdicts there really are i mean in the, in the overall grand scheme of of litigation here in georgia there are even fewer nursing home jury verdicts um and, and that that's something that needs to change but at the end of the day we also can't do anything criminal and this is um this is something that confuses a lot of people because i would tell them you know i i have a private practice and i do criminal law and they would ask me do you do prosecution or defense um which is a strange question to me because the government does the prosecution uh no civil firm can prosecute a a company or an individual so if you've got an issue with a nursing home and you think that there are criminal charges or they've they've violated some sort of criminal statute either federal or state you have to go to the district attorney's office or the assistant U.S. attorney's office for the federal issues and and have them file a criminal complaint. Because then, then there's a whole different set of solutions that the court may may have for for your specific case. You know, it could somebody might go to jail, for instance, or somebody may just be fined. And we've talked about the difference between civil and criminal um uh, actions in previous episodes. Um, so I would recommend that you go back and check that out and I'll, um, put that in the, um, I'll flash that up on the screen and have it in the show notes. But, um, again, it's just a matter of we, we, we as attorneys have to temper, we have to, um, manage the expectations of the clients. And that's what I'm saying. Like a lot of the clients just want, want, you know, I want them to have five CNAs at all times. And and, and I think a lot of times people are not even sure what they want. Right. You just know that your mother died in a in a manner that is unacceptable, um, in a facility that you and and the government are paying for her care, and you're angry and you're lashing out and your first thought is I'm going to get an attorney and I'm going to sue you. What the purpose of this episode is, is just to remind you that when you hire people like us, attorneys like us, to sue that defendant, that there's only one solution that we're looking at, and that is to get you monetary damages. Um, but, but then again, 
The idea is, the hope at least, is that when they have to pay out those monetary damages, they will do their own internal auditing and investigation and say, hey guys, listen, instead of paying, you know, X amount of money on jury verdicts or settlements, why don't we start investing more in staff and try to decrease the amount of litigation that we're doing? Although, theoretically. Theoretically, because I just don't see that. I mean, I, I've been dealing with nursing homes for 16 years now, and it's still a huge, huge problem. I, I just think a lot of times the money is just a cost of doing business for them. It really is. Um, well, we don't want to. We don't want to use this episode uh, to. Compl- or we don't want to use the entirety of this episode to talk about this particular topic. Yeah. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to to put the spotlight on the long term care ombudsman programs from around the country. Yeah. Who are going to be ha- or who had their thirty thirty. 41st birth I can't wait for the, to see that transcription they're 30 their 41st birthday this past Sunday on the 1st of December and we both um had our 40 41st birthday this year as well that's right so we are the same age that's right so we're giving away our age so it's been 41 years since the 1978 amendments to the older Americans Act required every state to have an ombudsman program and specifically define ombudsman functions and responsibilities. In 1972, the long-term care ombudsman program started out as a public health service demonstration project to meet the needs of residents facing problems in nursing homes. Today, the long-term care ombudsman program consists of 53 state programs and their statewide networks of over 500 local ombudsman entities. Um, And according to the National Ombudsman Reporting System, as of 2016, our our brothers and sisters in long-term care ombudsmen have investigated 199,493 complaints and resolved or partially resolved 73% of those. They visited 28,473 long-term care facilities at least quarterly. They've attended 22,405 uh, resident council meetings and 1,974 family council meetings provided 10,690 community education lessons and provided information and assistance to 378,526 individuals. Um, and, and these, and the ombudsmen, they're the ones that have a much larger toolbox of solutions for people because they're the ones that uh, if, if you're, you know, your loved ones in a nursing skilled nursing facility and they keep giving her rice when she likes mashed potatoes or they need to to change her medication schedule or any other issue that you're having a complaint you can go to the ombudsman they can go straight into that skilled nursing facility and try to work something out and if if the facility pushes back or, or is doesn't agree to whatever's lawful they can go to the state, you know, community health um, regulation authority, whoever that may be for that state. In Georgia, the Department of Community Health. And and that's the power that they have. It's not a court. It's not the civil justice system like we use. It's the regulatory system. They can go to the regulators and go, hey, I went into, you know, the, a place for mom uh, facility and they refused to do X, Y, and Z. And then the regulators can go in there and go, Hey, you've got to do this. Otherwise we're going to fine you, you know, thousands of dollars a day. But then again, it still ends up being about money. So we had just, if you want to learn more about the long-term care ombudsman programs in in your state or in the state of Georgia, we recommend that you go back and check out um, some of our old episodes in which we've interviewed long-term care ombudsman. And I would direct you to, let's see, we had um, William Whited, and he's an Oklahoma long-term care ombudsman, and we talked about the the role of long-term care ombudsman in, in his episodes, which were episodes 59 and 60. Then we had uh, Melanie McNeil, who is, um, whose role is what's her official capacity? She's a Georgia long-term care ombudsman. She's the head. She's, she's the head of. The she's program. the head of the program. Yeah. I don't know if it was like chief chief operator. Oh no. Um, episode 73. Uh, we talk about. Uh, the Georgia long-term care ombudsman program. So we encourage you to check those, those episodes out. Um, and just a, a bit of housekeeping matter. 
matters. Um, we will not be having an episode. We will not have an episode on December 23rd. Normally we come out, episodes come out every two weeks, but we are taking a break for um, the holidays. So there will not be an episode on December 23rd. We will actually be coming back in the new year on January 6th. And we have a fantastic episode uh, scheduled for you on that day. And that's, uh, we're going to be talking about pressure ulcers with guest Martha Kelso, who has been on the program before. And, yeah. and, and it's a, it's going to be a fantastic episode to start off uh, the new year. Um, and let's see, Will, what, what do you, we, it's pretty far out, but do you have any plans for the holidays? What are you, what are you doing? Going to the mountains? Probably going to go to the mountains. It'll be, uh, my niece's second Christmas and the first one where she's really kind of cognizant. See, she, she had her first year, uh, first birthday this year. And so, you know, now she's a year and a half old. Emma. Emma. And we'll start paying it more attention to Gene. Can we get can we get a picture of Emma up <laughs> eating her first birthday cake? Yeah, perfect. Very, um, very cute. Good job, Clay and Sarah. Yeah, but so they will. Uh, that'll be the first one where I can actually get her gifts that she may pay attention. What are you going to get a one and a half year old? They end up playing with the box instead or shiny objects. So it, it's she's still not quite at the age where she appreciates specific gifts. Hmm. Yeah. Um, well, that's going to complete this episode of the Nursing Home Abuse Podcast. Um, I'm actually kind of grateful that the guests canceled because it got we got to talk about the long-term care ombudsman program for a little yeah. bit. Um, but at any rate, you can catch new episodes with the exception of the next episode. You can catch episodes normally in the, in the, in the new year every two weeks, bi-monthly, on Monday mornings. You can check it out wherever you get your podcast from or online at nursinghomeabusepodcast.com or on our YouTube channel. And with that, we will see you next time. See you next time. Thanks for tuning in to the Nursing Home Abuse Podcast. Nothing said on this podcast, either by the host or the guest, should be construed as legal advice, nor is intended to create an attorney-client relationship between the host or their guest and the listener. New episodes are available every Monday on Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, or on your favorite podcast app, as well as on YouTube and our website, nursinghomeabusepodcast.com. Again, that's nursinghomeabusepodcast.com. See you next time.